first impression. That gentleman, there are few people I talk to more than that him and him. I shook his hand more times than I could count. I followed him up to the altar to pray. We shared a couple tear-filled hugs after he shared his testimony. And uh, his phone number's in my phone. I plan on visiting him very soon. I had very low expectations going into that camp, unfortunately. But the only way I can describe it is as being truly life-changing. Actually, I really like this one a lot more than I did the other one because this one was so much smaller, so it felt so much more homey than the other one I've been to. Um, you could see a face you've seen anywhere you went. And um, we, they split us up into groups based on age and gender, and those were really good meetings. We had very, we all shared our testimonies like they were really good meetings. Um, the topic verse for that week was 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And it was saying that we are a new creation, and that went into everything we did. And it was like, um, we went there, and every sermon, every message was, you are meant to be changed from this. Um, the worship was amazing. The amount of kids who stepped out and went down to the altar, there was like one boy who went down, and then like 30 followed him. It was just really cool to see. Um, I didn't know who I'd meet there. I wasn't expecting to make, like, a lot of friends, but there's one girl that stood out to me. She inspired me. Her name is Lucy. Um, she just did, she just helped me a lot, because on Thursday there was a talent night, and she was the one who convinced me to do it. Um, I sang in the talent night. So that was that was very scary for me. I didn't know what to, didn't know how I would do. I was very nervous, and she just told me she's like, "You have absolutely got it. You look great. You're gonna do amazing." So that was that was, really, that was she helped me a lot through that. Um, but the games, like we, we had so much fun. Their games were amazing. The staff, they just connected. notes on this. So I'm just spitting a bunch of stuff out. But like I said, it was really life changing for me. Um, <laughs> um, <is he? laughs> um, again, I don't have any notes. So we're just going to wing it. <laughs> um, what stood out a lot to me was again, the worship. Um, that was probably by far my favorite part, and I think it was on Wednesday night whenever everybody was singing and everybody went up to the altar, and the altar was overflowing into the seats. And that was just amazing for me to see. Um, I mean, <laughs> I got saved. <laughs> just like an eye-opening experience. I mean, I'm not sure if I did it last time. Okay. Um, same night, JC got saved. Um, yeah. Um, I decided to get together for you. never been super big into this stuff. Like religion, I don't know. It just, it never stood out to me, and I was never really big on it. 
but Callie went up to the altar, I think it was, was it Wednesday night? Wednesday night. And I had gone up there, and and I had not gone, I had put my hand on her, I don't know. I felt something, like, and after we went back up to the, um, where we were sitting, I just had the urge to go back up there, and so I went up back up there, and I just started sobbing, and they joined me, and it just, I kept crying. <laughs> I, I couldn't stop you crying. Me start crying. Yeah. I, I looked up, whenever I looked up, they were all crying. We got back to the stands, and everyone was still crying. It was, it was something, but um, I didn't know what it was, and so later that night, um, during our church groups, we would have church groups, and we'd talk about that what we had talked about that night, the sermon, and I had talked to everybody, and we had all, JC had decided she wanted to be saved, and I decided that we wanted to get saved, and we all basically did a prayer circle, and we all, yeah, and we ended that day. <laughs> so y'all can guess what my favorite night of the week was. <laughs> Wednesday night, we were all a big ball of tears um, to, 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 to see these young people just come out of their skin and blossom. And I wish Emma was here because there was such a transformation in her between Monday and Friday. Um, she a dedicated her life on Tuesday uh, and came out on us, on, uh, with us on Wednesday uh, to, for all three of them just to, to, to pray from the heart all of us together, laying hands on one another. It was just so, so awesome on Wednesday night. Um, and again, with Emma, I mean, she was quiet and by herself. And then by Friday, she was jumping up and down and singing praise and worship. It was just a different person from Monday to Friday. And these guys as well. I've, I've had so much fun, fun uh, spending time with them. And, and uh, I... I truly believe that all all of us are new this week. I mean, it, it was definitely an experience that that uh, I will not soon forget. That's for sure. And again, with the worship and stuff, they, they are they are not wrong. The altar overflowing with young people, um, backed up two pews deep, laying hands one on, on 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 each other, praying over each other. It was just so so powerful in in worship and response. Um, I just wish you guys could be there. I couldn't take pictures. They didn't want phones out at all, and I can understand that because so many of these young people are truly addicted to their cell phones. But uh, um, I do have a few, and if, if, if I would like to see them, I'll, I'll gladly share. But it was just so, so good, so powerful, and I'm so proud of these young people here. Thank you. Join me in praying for these. Please reach out and just perform. Lord, we thank you for for each one of these or for JC and for Lily and Dane and Callie and for Aaron for Emma for being obedient to, to go and to not knowing what to expect and Lord they experienced you and how powerful how powerful it is Lord to witness it and Lord, Lord we pray for each one of them we thank you for them and we pray that the fire of the Holy Spirit would continue to draw them, to fill them. Lord, give them opportunities to, to share this, this fire of God with, with others this summer and as it bleeds into next school year. So, Lord, we pray that their witness would be strong, dear Lord, and that you would guard them, you would guard their eyes, their ears, their mind, keep them safe. But, Lord, let them be, let them be radical for the sake of the gospel to reach others for Jesus. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you so much. We thank you for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to fill up the baptistry, as you might well expect. And uh, so, uh, the first Sunday of, of July, uh, we'll have more, more baptisms. God is good. Amen. God is good. Uh, it's... Uh, it's my privilege to internet introduce Daniel Nally to you. Uh, Daniel and I go back uh, a number of, of years, and uh, the honor that I have for 
Daniel is, is off the charts. Because we like to talk about evangelism. We like to have evangelism. Yes, kids, you can go. I'm sorry. Yeah, kids, you can go. You can go. And thank you, guys. Thank you. We love to talk about evangelism. We love to go to evangelism training. We love to, to stick that feather in our cap that says we've had evangelism training and we're ready to take on the world. And then rarely do we, right? I, I love because Daniel lives it every day. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people have come to Christ directly because of Daniel and his obedience to go to all parts of the world, all parts of southern Illinois to, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to call people to repentance. And if can you imagine if we all did that, how much this, this church, this community, and our world would be changed for the gospel of Jesus. We have a, a video to show, and then Daniel's going to come. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? We are a missional movement that seeks to equip the next generation of believers to take the gospel message outside the four walls of the church. We believe evangelism is a lifestyle. Through our lifestyle evangelism training, we seek to create organic outreach by establishing a culture of people who live on mission in everyday life. We believe God wants to encounter each person in every city, so we are passionate about partnering with local churches to host citywide outreaches. We can't do this alone. Gather a team of friends over spring break and come serve for a week during our spring impact mission trip. Or maybe you feel called to offer six months of your life to live as a missionary in the trenches of America. Prayerfully consider joining the missional internship where you will experience deep discipleship and hands-on training and outreaches all across Illinois and the nation. We are Gospel Encounter and our mission is to know Jesus and make Jesus known. How's everyone doing? Good. It is such an honor to be here. Uh, I love Brian. And Brian, thank you so much for having me. Um, you guys have an awesome pastor. Um, Brian loves God. He loves people. Um, he's the same way everywhere he goes. And um, I tell you what, it's hard to find people who just love the Word and who love the Spirit and who love God and who love people and who just are the same, on the stage, off the stage, in their office, in the meetings, and then in private. So praise God that you guys have a, a real shepherd who has a heart for God and a heart for people. Well, my name is Daniel Nally. Normally, uh, we have this running joke at Gospel Encounter. The first time we went to preach in the 33 County Crusades, I got up there at Cairo, Illinois. We took 155 laborers with us to knock on every door in Alexander and Pulaski County. And when we got up to, to, to preach, I, I was just looking at the people who were there, and I was so overcome by the, the presence of God and just the, the urgency of the gospel. And I got up and I said, my name is, and I'm just looking at their eyes and looking at the people who are lingering in the background, the people who are kind of wanting to maybe jet out. They've already eaten the food. They've already gotten their games and gotten their prizes, right? And they've already been mingling for a while. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, man, we don't have time. And I said, hello, my name is, and he went, never mind. It doesn't matter who I am because the only name you need to remember when you leave here is the name of Jesus because the Bible says that there is no name that has been given under the sun by which people might call on to be saved other than the name of Jesus. And so it's the name of Jesus that must be lifted high. But here I will tell you, I am Daniel Nally, and I'm so glad to be here. Um, Gospel Encounter is a ministry that my wife and I founded several years back. 
and we have seen thousands of people come to Christ, and God has been moving and just doing beautiful things. But how many of you guys know that it's not about the methods, it's not about the name, it's not about the personality, it's about the gospel. The power to change lives is in the power of the gospel, and the gospel must be preached. So I'm going to tell you real quick how we're going to, how we're, what we're going to do today. This morning, I'm going to start off, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Gospel Encounter for anyone who doesn't know. I'm going to do that quickly, and so if you're like, man, I want to know more, come talk to me, come to the booth. We'll also be here, I'll be here tonight, more of my team, we'll have about 20 people here, nine full-time missionaries that are with Gospel Encounter that I get to lead. They will be here this morning, or uh, tonight, and then we'll be back on Monday night from 6 to 8 with an evangelism, lifestyle evangelism training. So that's less on how to dialogue with someone, you know, like thinking of how do I take someone through the Romans road, or how do I do the way of the master? It's less of that and more of cultivating a heart for reaching people in your area of influence in everyday life. You don't want to miss it. Um, and I'm so excited to be doing this close to home now. We've traveled the nation the last two years, and this is the closest I've been um, in a long time. So praise God. Um, so then what I'm going to do after that, we're going to look at some scripture. And I'm going to tell you this is the goal. This is the upfront, right? The goal is we're going to look at the scripture where Paul says in the last days it's going to get rough. It's going to get hard. It's going to get bonkers. It's going to be wild. But he says, you're to do the work of an evangelist. And we're going to look about the hope that we have to do the work of an evangelist, even in the middle of a world that calls right things wrong and wrong things right. Amen? Hang on to your seat. You ready? If you're ready, say amen. 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 Some of you didn't say amen. You're not ready. <laughs> you're going to get ready. Here we go. So, Gospel Encounter, our mission is to know Jesus and make Jesus known. By becoming all things to all people, being trained in the Word of God, and being led by the Spirit of God. So we have one mission at Gospel Encounter, and it's simply to know Jesus. We don't have two missions, to know Him, and then a second mission to make Him known. I like to say it like this. If you picture your, your, your life with Jesus, of you going after Jesus and seeking after him and, 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 and studying the word and praying and seeking him with your heart, if you picture that like Jesus being the destination, Jesus being the land or the island, and you're on the ocean, you're on the boat, and you've got your sail up, and you're, you're sailing toward your destination, which is Jesus, the waves that leave the boat. That is ministry. When we seek Jesus, the natural byproduct is ministry. To know Jesus is to love Jesus. To love Jesus is you have to share Jesus. You just can't keep him to yourself. Right? Every time we get a product that we like, we go to Amazon, man, and we tell about it. And all you ladies, every time you get a product that you like, right, you tell the other ladies about it, whether it's a recipe or, or, or it's makeup or, or hair products or guys with tools or or, or whatever, whatever your hobby is, every time you find something that works, that's good, you like to recommend it. To know Jesus is to love Jesus. You cannot know him without loving him. And you cannot be in love with him without sh wanting to, everyone else to know him. Amen? Amen. So, let's go to the next slide here. So when we first got started, we did the 33-county tour. We sold everything. We, we took our life savings. Many of you remember this. We, we launched this tour. We went to every single county. This has been four years ago now um, in southern Illinois. We've seen thousands of salvation. God moved in a great way. And then now we're traveling all over the nation, really all over the world. We'll be in Pakistan, um, Af parts of Africa. We'll be, I'll be in, uh, where am I going? Thailand, I'm preaching in Thailand in uh, August, and then we're, we're all over Illinois. We've already been to Blanchester, Ohio, Winchester, Virginia, Salem, Oregon, uh, Portland, Oregon, New Orleans. We're headed next week to Chattanooga, Tennessee, then Louisville, Kentucky, and then Chicago, then St. Louis, then Shelbyville, Illinois, and, so, and then we end in Petersburg, Illinois for the end of our summer uh, tour. So be praying for us. Let's go to the next tour. Or the next tour. Wow. <laughs> one, one summer at a time. We do four things at Gospel Encounter. Our mission, like I said, is to make Jesus known. 
We do citywide outreaches, lifestyle evangelism trainings, which we're going to be doing one here on Monday. Like I said, another plug for that, be there. We do six-month missional internship. God blessed us with a, with a three-bedroom house, two, two, two bathrooms, um, two-car garages. We're hoping to eventually build a, do- a girl's dormitory over there where we are taking young people who feel called to evangelism and missions where they come through Bible classes, discipleship classes for three months, then they spend three months on the road with us as missionaries and evangelists traveling, sharing the gospel from rural areas, from small communities to big urban um, cities. And then finally, we host spring break mission um, impact trips. So when your community, that's an example of one that we just did in Winchester. We were just back in Winchester, Virginia, um, like maybe a month ago. So let's go to the next one. Oh, 80 salvations there, by the way. At the event itself, I don't have a calculation of all the salvations that happened the two days out on the streets, but probably at least half, maybe 40 or so. Um, lifestyle evangelism training, that's uh, one we did with a church in Memphis, and that's us actually leading these two, the, the lady with the mask and the gentleman beside her uh, here, leading them to Christ after we gave away 1,200 bags of groceries, knocked on their door, they invited us in, ended up leading to Christ, then later we were out in the parking lot and they were taking us to, to other apartments, hey man, you gotta go tell so-and-so about this Jesus guy, beautiful, let's go to the next one, uh, that's the discipleship house, right now we have four full-time guy missionaries that are living there, they none, they none get paid by Gospel Encounter, they all raise their own support, and so they raise their support, they come, and they are Keyword, fully immersed in discipleship and outreach. It's a beautiful time of just being consecrated unto the Lord. And I'm saying, hey, I'm giving, I'm giving a year of my life. The first, year, the first six months is raising their funds. The next six months is going. So we say give a year as a free will offering to the Lord and pray about a lifetime. Amen. So then go to the next one here. Yeah, and you can just kind of go through these here until we get to my message. Just kind of maybe every five seconds. That's Oklahoma. I got to <laughs> preach there, 30,000 people, the biggest thing I've ever spoken in front of. And um, Carbon to Illinois, these are more guys that were discipling. Um, that's a retreat we did. This is in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Keep it, pause on that for just a minute. I was preaching the gospel there. I was at the Pulse 100 headquarters with Nick Hall, and I'm right downtown, and I'm about to go up. I'm actually the first speaker, and there's a glass wall all right here. And then I'm about to go up, and all of a sudden we hear pop, 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 right outside of, I mean, the glass wall is like 10 feet from me right here. The stage goes this way. I'm looking up, and this guy has gotten off the bus. Two guys drive by, and they shoot him dead right off the bus. Within five minutes, there was probably 20 police cars there. It was so wild. And then um, the whole night got wrecked. We all went out kind of went out to the streets and started talking to people about eternity. Life can be gone just like that. Come on. we got to put our faith in Jesus, right? So anyway, I wanted to share about that. Then the next day, we went to St. Louis Park, and then that's what that photo was. That there is Winchester again. Let me go to the next one. This is recent. This is, um, this stuff here is different, different uh, photos of our young missionaries sharing the gospel on the streets in Carbondale, whenever the uh, eclipse went through. So we were down there, we, we joined up with, um, uh, what is his name? Oh, um, he's over missions in the Southern Baptist Church in the Su- in Carbondale area. Oh man, I wish I could remember his name. Awesome guy, uh, but we went down there, partnered with him, got to share the gospel with hundreds of people that day. We'll go to the next one here. And that's, our in, that's more of our intern, just photos of them sharing. And then we go to the next one. <laughs> yeah, Benton, Arkansas, that was powerful. 800 decisions the first night for Christ. Casting crowns came and played for free. It was awesome. Next one. End of the age. Okay, here we go. Are you ready now? So, wanted to get th- just get through that. That's just a little, some testimonies of what we do. Um, if you would ever want to go on a mission trip with us, if you ever want to go do a city outreach with us, um, you just sign up. You can get one of our newsletters back there. Sign up for our newsletter, and you'll see. You'll stay updated on all the things that we're doing. Let's pray, and we're going to dive into God's word. Father God, we come before you this morning, so grateful 
for all that you're doing. I thank you, God, for this, this, the beauty of seeing these young ones up here and the devotion. And I thank you for, for the, uh, the teens that shared their testimonies about camp. God, we're, we're so grateful for that. We're so thankful for that. But look, we're asking for more. There's so many more young people that need to be here. There's so many more young people that need that experience at the altar, at a, in the valley of decision, to make a decision for you. We're crying out for more, Lord. Would you raise up people who are unashamed of the gospel? Would you equip them, but more than equipping them, God, would you just burden their heart to be unashamed, whether they're fully ready or not, that they would say, I must share Jesus. And I pray you bless this word today, God as we just stay right in line with the scriptures, line by line, verse by verse. We love you, Jesus. I pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So, we're going to get into, we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to work our way through it. I want to tell you, Paul, the Apostle Paul is, one of, is, is probably one of... Um, my favorite people other than Jesus in the Bible. I love the Apostle Paul. I love his conversion story. Um, because it just seems like the Apostle Paul, when, whenever you know, he was known as, as, as Saul and he's going around, he's, he's persecuting Christians, it just would seem like this guy would never get saved. This guy is so far gone. And I love Paul's life and his story and his testimony because it shows that anyone can get saved, that the power of the gospel can penetrate and change any heart. And so as we get ready to go into this message, I want to just preference it with this. The Apostle Paul is writing one of his last letters here. He's writing to a, a young man that he has been discipling, Timothy. And he's writing to him, and he's telling, he's going to tell Timothy, he's going to say, I'm, a, I'm about to go. I've fought the fight. I've ran the race. And my time's about up. And he's, and he's going to be very honest with Timothy. Timothy, I'm leaving you, and I'm leaving you in a world that is, that is wild. I'm leaving you, leaving you in a world that... Man, people aren't going to put up with sound teaching. They're not going to put up with, with correct doctrine. They're not going to believe the same gospel message that you believe and preach. But Timothy, in the middle of this, I'm exhorting you. And I'm calling you. Be thrusted out into the world. Do not retreat, but go forward and do the work of an evangelist. And evangelize in this wild, crazy world. Let's look at the scriptures, and I believe that as we read through them, we'll, we'll see, like, man, this, a lot of this looks like America. A lot of this might look like your workplace. Maybe this might look like you, your house or your family. Maybe even some of it, if we're honest, friends, if I'm honest, too, some of this might even look like our own heart at times, okay? But remember, the power of the gospel to change every heart. Amen? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. says, but understand this. How many of you know the Bible says, but understand this? We better put our, our like, listening ears on, right? Paul was telling Timothy, understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money. They will be proud and arrogant. Wow. I want you to notice something, though, real quick. He says, but understand this. In the last days, there will come times of difficulty. But notice this, friends. There's coming times of difficulty, according to Paul. And then he's going to go on and list all of these things. But notice this. It's not times of difficulty that produce all of these things that we are going to call the happenings of the heart. It's not the times of difficulty that produce the happenings of the heart. But it's the happenings of the heart that produce the times of difficulty. You say, well, how do you know that, Daniel? Because, friends, listen, the Bible says that in all things we are to give thanks to God, right? The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength, that today is the day the Lord has made, and we will what? Rejoice and be glad in it. The Bible says no matter what's going on, as for me and my household, huh, you can do what you want. 
but we're going to serve the Lord. Amen? Okay, so it doesn't matter when, if, if all hell's breaking loose, or it doesn't matter if there's like chaos within, within society and in our lives. It doesn't produce the happenings of the heart. Because when the heart is guarded, there can be things happening around us that cannot get inside of us. Amen? But what happens, though, when the happenings of the heart begin to, to experience and give way to some of these things that Paul talks about, that's when difficult times emerge upon the earth. When people become unappeasable. When the human heart becomes unappeasable, it's going to be hard for you guys to live in a culture where the heart of everyone around you is unappeasable. You make a mistake, and even when you apologize, even when you, you ask for forgiveness, they're just unappeased. And even when you pay re retribution or you, you pay it back and you make it right, they're still unappeased. I want your house, I want your car, I want your life over. Unappeasable. We're not even true, justice is enough. And how many of you know that produces difficult times? We live in difficult times, and we're headed for difficult times. But the, 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 the point of this message today is that Jesus is with us. And he's called us to do the work of evangelist in the middle of the said times. Let's keep, let's keep going. But understand this, in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money. You know, what's real, you know what produces hard times? When everyone you work with is just a lover of self. When, every, when, it's a, when it's a cutthroat environment. Well, I don't want you to get ahead or I don't want you to get a promotion because I want it. You can suffer. You can stay at minimum wage. I, I need to go up. When we live in a society where, where people are self-lovers, it produces difficult times. Lovers of money, proud and arrogant. When you work and you live in a nation of people who have become proud, they become proud. The Bible says that God gives grace to the humble, but what? He opposes the proud. Some translations say he resists the proud. That word resist in the Greek, we don't, I don't have time to unpack it here fully, but it it's the same concept as, as if a person would resist arrest. If, if, if a police officer would go and they would try to, to arrest someone for maybe, you know, robbing someone and the person's trying to get away and the police officer's saying, no, I'm, I'm putting these cuffs on you, you're, you're, you're going to jail, you can't rob people. And the person that's getting arrested, they're trying to resist, they're pulling their arm away and they're trying to run away and they've got to subdue them. God does that. He resists the proud. It's not just that the proud don't get grace. It's not just a withholding of grace. It's what you get is resistance. And how many of you know in a nation that is proud, God resists the proud? Why? Because only the humble in heart can, can experience salvation. Only the humble of heart can experience the solution for all of the problems. And so the Bible says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And Paul here, he's telling Timothy, he's saying, in these last days, he says, in the last days, some translations say at the end of the age. In the last days or at the end of the age. People will be lovers of money. They will be proud, arrogant. They will be abusive. They will be disobedient to their parents. They will be ungrateful. When you live in a world that is ungrateful, it produces difficult times. Unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous. When you live in a world where everyone has power to publish anything at the tips of their fingers, and they slander, 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 difficult times are upon the earth. Without self-control, when you live in a world without self-control, where everyone just operates in the beast mentality. We were created in the image of God. We are not beast. The beast mentality says, I'm a lion, I'm hungry, 
You're the little gazelle. I'm going to eat you because I'm bigger, I'm stronger, I'm hungry. It's too bad. The lion doesn't go up to the gazelle and say, hey, you got a wife and kids at home, bud? I mean, are you, you, um, I mean, are you older in age? I mean, are you got a disease? You're going to die off? I mean, are you okay to eat? He doesn't care because he has a beast mentality. And we are not beasts. The lion doesn't care about controlling his appetite. I'm hungry. I'm strong. I'm, I'm apex predator. I'm going to eat you. But we are called not to have a beast mentality. We are called to uphold the image of God, the Imago Dei, which is upon us. And Paul is telling Timothy there's going to be people who have no self control. They won't control their sensual desires. And we, we're not going to go in that. It's not what this sermon's about, right? But we can see this month that it's just haywire. But they won't control sensual desires. They also, they, 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 they won't be able to control themselves. Like they'll be addicted to things, right? They will be out of control and something else will be in control over them. And that produces, friends, for us difficult times. But there's hope. Say, Daniel, you're talking a lot about the difficult times. Come on, we, we got to get through the difficult times, amen? We're going to get through them, friends. But we got to do it God's way. Goes on, he says, they will be brutal. I'm not, I'm not going to pause on all of them, but just think about this. They will be brutal. Brutal, you know. When some people say, well, I'm just bold, or I'm just, you know, I'm just outspoken. It's, no, man, you're brutal. You're rude. And sometimes we'll, 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 we'll take a label and we'll try to label it something else. But really, we're brutal. Brutal, is, you say, well, man, I just tell the truth. I just tell it the way it is. And, man, listen, you're, you're, you're listening to a preacher that I preach it the way it is. But we're not called to be brutal. When we're brutal, it's the same thing as beast mentality, and it produces difficult times. We're to do everything in gentleness and in love. And when you live in a, in a world that is brutal, there's no room for reconciliation. Because, <laughs> When we live for an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, you guys might be, have heard this, it leaves everyone wearing eye patches and eating soup. <laughs> Paul says they're, they're brutal. They're not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. They are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. Hang in here with me. They have an appearance of godliness, but they lack the power thereof, or they deny the power to, for transformation. So it's like this, if I can give you an illustration. It's like a red balloon. Say we have a red balloon, and then we have a red bowling ball, right? A red balloon, red bowling ball. Same exact color. Same exact shape. One has power, substance. The other's full of hot air. But it still has the shape. It still has the form. I can take a, a, I can take a, a balloon and I can bounce it right to Pastor Brian right now. And even if he was not even paying attention, it's, it has, it's, of, it's of no consequence. It doesn't even matter if he's paying attention. It'll bounce right off him. But if I take a 16-pound bowling ball and I say, Brian, heads up! I mean, watch out. Why? Because that has substance. That has power. There's impact behind that thing. And he says, in the last days, there's going to be a lot of people that have a form of godliness, but they're not going to have the power, the transformative power. They're not going to have the substance. And he says, have nothing to do with such people. That's not to be the praise that we sing to our God, a form of godliness. That's not to be the message to the world, just the outer shell form of godliness. But the message to the world is a transformed life that is having an obedient, just magnificent adventure with Jesus. That carries power. That carries weight. I'm going to get through this. He says, avoid such people, verse 6. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins 
and led astray by various passions, always learning but never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambers opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and are disqualified regarding faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was of those two men. Paul is dealing with men who ha- are preaching a false gospel. They have a, they're, 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 they're trying to tell these people, you're okay, you've got the form. You know the words, you said the words, you had you have the emotional experience, right? Like, you're good enough. He's saying these, these, these people that are coming in, these people that are being raised up, that are proving really, the context really means that all those things that he said were happening, these, these men who are supposed to be heralds of the gospel, they, they were okay with these things. They were proving these things instead of rebuking them. They were allowing the happenings of the heart to, no pun intended, happen. So, verse 10 He says, you, however, and I would say that to you, Woodlawn, you, however, this isn't isn't the way it is with you. You have followed my teachings, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions, and my sufferings that happened to me at Antioch and at Iconium and at Lystria, which persecutions I endured, yet for them all the Lord rescued me. And indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse. Wow. Deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. If we are going to, if we are going to evangelize and we're going to stand up, and say, hey, we're going, we, we, enough is enough. We can't live like this. We have to return to the word of God. All scripture is God-breathed. We need the scriptures. And it's the scriptures that begin to bring the, the heart back into alignment. Let's keep going. So Paul, this is chapter 4. He says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Rebuke, reprove, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Rebuke and exhort with complete patience and and teaching. Listen, when we, when we rebuke the world, we must do it with what? Complete what? It, we must do it with complete patience and teaching. When we rebuke the world, we must rebuke them in patience and in teaching. So when the world is having the happenings of the heart, we must be patient with them. We call people to repentance. We call people to come and meet Jesus. But what happens is, if you're not patient with them, you'll just go and say, you know you shouldn't be doing that. You know that that's wrong. You need to stop doing that. Come on, what's wrong with you? And guess what? Because you didn't follow the Word of God with patience, and teaching, instruction, discipleship. They walked away thinking, man, man, look at that, that, that person is all they want to see is behavior modification. If you want heart transformation, you have to, you have to reprove and rebuke with patience and 
teaching. If you don't, it will lead the world that you're wanting to reach. It will lead them to shame. And they will have shame. But, what, but it also says exhort. So the, the people that you're exhorting, that you are encouraging, whether it be brothers or sisters in Christ or anything good that you're finding in someone that you're ministering and you're applauding, man, I'm proud of you for doing that. But when you exhort, you also must be patient and do it with teaching. Why? Because if you, if you don't, you will flatter them. And instead of remaining humble, they will be puffed up and conceited, and the happenings of the heart will start happening all over again. So what, what is the, what's the moral? The moral is that if we're going to minister into this type of word, world, according to the word of God, we must do this work of discipleship and evangelism through the word of God, exhorting and rebuking with patience and teaching. And if we miss, we have to exhort and rebuke. It's the truth. But in both, we must do it with patience and teaching. You know, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees and they didn't listen. You know, he rebuked his disciples too. But they listened. They took it to heart. And the happenings of their heart began to become aligned. Let's keep going. Verse 3, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate to themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Friends, listen. So many times we'll be like, man, that person's a false teacher, or man, that, 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 there are so many people teaching wrongly. Friends, it's supply and demand. It's supply and demand. The Bible says it's not the false teachers gathering around to them a congregation. The Bible says after the happenings of the heart have been, been happening, the people of this world, as they're facing difficult times, seek out these types of false teachers. And it says the people are, are gathering around themselves teachers who will tell them what they want to hear. Tell me more about that life where you have a form of godliness, but you don't actually change. Give me that balloon. That balloon's a lot lighter to play with. That balloon's of no consequence. And he's... And if we don't get back to the word of God, if we don't get back to the scriptures, we are not going to know how to minister and to navigate. We're not going to know how to minister and navigate our own hearts, let alone the world. And remember I said we have one mission, to know Jesus. And out of that, the overflow is to make him known. We have to get back to the word. I'm looking at my time, I know. Okay, let me finish this out. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate to themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth, and they will wander off into myths. As for you, Woodlawn, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, and do the work of of an evangelist. Paul is telling Timothy in the context of the world going crazy, do the work of an evangelist. Don't retreat. When they call right things wrong and wrong things right, don't retreat. You have to move forward. Do it through exhortation and rebuke in all teaching and patience. We, got, we have to move forward with teaching and patience. Finally, let's look at our last scripture here. Okay, let, this is where Paul tells Timothy, he says, for, verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So, what is the work of an evangelist? What is the work of the evangelist? Paul says to do the work, but what is the work? This is simply it. It should be on the screen behind me. 
Seek God with an undivided heart. That's what the evangelist does. And when I say evangelist, I'm not talking about career evangelists like Daniel Nally. I'm talking about, watch this, Paul was writing to a pastor of a church, Timothy. Timothy was, 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 was over the church locally. And Paul was telling Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Well, I thought an evangelist was just those special people that, no, pastor, do the work of an evangelist. No, Christian, elder, deacon, member, anyone who's put their faith in Christ, do the work of an evangelist. Everyone. And so as an an evangelist or someone who does the work of an evangelist, the number one thing we do is we seek God with an undivided heart. And as we seek God with an undivided heart, there's no room for the happenings because our heart can't be divided by the world. It's already been rightly divided by God's word. Number two, share the gospel in simplicity and truth. I'm not impressed. Listen, I I just spoke at at Corbin University. Then I went down to Bridges Christian College, and I've been hanging out with, I was at Asbury. I've hung out and I've talked with scholars theologians, the guys that write the big thick ones, you know, that make really good, like, door stoppers. <laughs> I'm joking, Corey. I've read a couple. <laughs> I'm not impressed. I'm not impressed by all the, the people who can take simple things and make them very complicated. Jesus takes very complicated things and he makes them simple. That's why I love, man, seeing the kids doing their little devotion up here. That's what we're called to do for our own heart and for the world. Number three, build bridges for the gospel. That's what an evangelist does. Build bridges for the gospel. I want to end with reading this last scripture from Jesus. Jesus is the hope. Matthew 24, 9 says, Jesus speaking, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. Wait a minute, hold up. I don't ever want to keep reading. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will, will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of lawlessness will be increased. The love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures till the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. This is, this, I, just have one, I just have one more point here. What? Watch this. What does he say? The hearts of many will grow cold because of sin and lawlessness abounding in the end of the age. This is what, this, this is, I gave you exhortation, I'm going to give you more exhortation. This is my word of caution for every Christian in the room. As sin and lawlessness abound in our nation, in our communities, even right here in rural southern Illinois, we must guard our hearts that sin and lawlessness does not abound in our own heart, first and foremost. But also, we cannot make our mission field our enemy. As we see lawlessness and sin abounding in the world, we can look and say, man, can you believe what they're trying to teach our kids? Can you believe what they're voting at the school board or at the county board or the city board? Or can you believe what they're doing in spring? You can, we can say these things and we can say, man, can you believe our neighbor so-and-so down the road, they're doing this now or that? And we can say all those things and as lawlessness increases, if we're not careful, our hearts will grow cold. Guard your heart in the end of the age, so that your heart doesn't grow cold. If your heart grows cold, you will not do the work of an evangelist because you will not exhort and rebuke with patience and teaching. When your heart's cold, the patience and teaching is the last thing from your heart, the last thing from your mind. Guard your heart, friends. And lastly, this is the scripture I want to end with. Jesus said, Matthew 28, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even till the end of the age. This Woodlawn, hear my heart. Hear the Father's heart. You are equipped and ready and 
able to share this gospel message with every Muslim, LGBTQ person, atheist, agnostic, Mormon, prodigal, backslider, everyone. Why? Because you are not sent out on a mission for Jesus. That's not what the scripture said. And remember, today we're returning to what is written. Jesus said, behold, I am with you, even till what? The end of the age. The end of the age that he described and then that Paul described. Jesus is saying, you can do the work of an evangelist. Because you're not alone, I'm with you. Woodlawn, he's with you. Can I pray for you? I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor Brian. Father God, thank you so much for your word. God, thank you for the word of God that is unchanging, that line by line and verse by verse, it changes our heart, it, it cuts our heart. Lord, I pray a blessing over this place, over every heart here and over this local congregation. Lord, I know that it's, it's, it's hard. How am I going to talk to so-and-so at work about Jesus when they believe this and that, or when I could get fired or this and all these things are on the line? God, may your word, the urgency of your word, may we be willing to count the cost, and but we may, may we be willing to to do all evangelism with patience and teaching may we build bridges may we preach the gospel in truth and in simplicity and father god above all may we know you and make you known even to the end of the age in jesus name amen